Buenas tardes, soy Lara y estoy muy feliz de estar aquí y estoy disfrutando de mi tiempo en Chile mucho, mucho. So, <laughs> muchas gracias. <laughs> so, the concept of One Health or Una Salud describes that all the health on our planet is inextricably linked. So it extends the concept of health that has originally only focused on human health and global health to the health of all other organisms on our planet. So this includes other animal species, but also plant species and even microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi or viruses. And the One Health concept also includes the health of entire ecosystems. So a very good example, I always think, of that One Health is actually an empirical, measurable thing, is the link that we know between human-made biodiversity destruction and the emergence of zoonotic diseases. And COVID-19 has obviously been a really good example for that. So I'm a professor in Munich, and in my research group, we study how we can use genomic technology as well as AI to better understand One Health. And I'm very excited to be here today in Santiago at Congreso Futuro to discuss how we can try to leverage these advances in the technology to also contribute to the betterment of our society. I've also, via this QR code, made available several of my original research publications in case you're interested, and I will show those throughout my talk. So the topic of our session, the final session for today now, is La Genetica que nos conecta. So genomic research is really about the data analysis of DNA. And as you have already learned in previous sessions, DNA is actually a very simple molecule. It contains or it consists of four basic building blocks, as you can see color coded here. And these building blocks really make up all the heritable material in our bodies and actually in the bodies of all other living organisms. So this is how DNA connects us, because all of the living organisms on this planet actually contain DNA in their cells. Now, that means that we can actually obtain DNA from humans, from all sorts of other animals, if this is wild animals or farm animals, from plants, from the food that we eat, but also from entire ecosystems, such as water or air ecosystems. Because there is like a huge hidden biodiversity, microbial diversity, it's so like diversity of microorganisms that live all around us all the time, we just don't see them. But we can measure those using genomic approaches, and this is the so-called microbiome, for example, the water or air microbiome that we can measure with these genomic approaches. Now, those microbiomes also contain pathogens, like, as previously mentioned, uh, like zoonotic pathogens that can actually jump from animals onto humans and be a threat for our global health. So ideally now, to be able to, do, to use genomics to better understand one health. We have a technology that can create data fast, in a cheap manner, in a straightforward manner, easy to use, and also ideally in a portable manner, so that we can bring the technology wherever we need it, but also to ensure global accessibility, so that not only the most developed countries have access to this te genomic technology. So let's see how we can achieve this. So with our DNA, we can actually feed it into like really cutting edge technology. And this brings me um, to the description of what we are using at the moment. This is technology being produced by the company Oxford Nanopore Technologies, and it's called nanopore sequencing. So how it works is that there are tiny nanopores embedded in membranes. And there is an ionic current going through these nanopores. Now, when we are actually having our DNA go through these nanopores at the same time as the ionic current, we are disrupting the ionic current in a characteristic manner that we can then, using AI, translate into the actual DNA sequence, so these four building blocks I've just been telling you about. Like this, obtain all the necessary genomic data that we need. 
Now, this might seem quite like a quite easy approach for you, but if you know how genomic data has been created before this technological revolution, it has really been like a, a crazy advance for multiple reasons. The one thing is that you can actually take the native DNA, so we could take some saliva from you, extract some DNA from you, and here the DNA that was just in your body through those nanopores and measure the DNA sequence. But also how this technology works means it's fast. We can use our super powerful AI algorithms to create data in real time. It's cheap. It's very easy to teach others how to use it. And importantly, it's also portable. So here you see one of the Minayan sequencing devices that if you pair them with portable embedded AI devices, you can just bring into the field. And if you then add a portable battery and uh, like um, some uh, portable solar panels, as you can see here, you can really do the analysis anywhere around the world. So let's look at a few examples of how we are leveraging this genomic technology to better understand one health. As a first example, we can try to contribute to animal health. So during my research time in New Zealand, I've actually studied critically endangered species, where we went to very remote islands in New Zealand where no other genomic technology would be accessible. And we studied this nocturnal critically endangered parrot, the kakapo. Um, where the chicks actually get serious fungal infections in their nests. So we waited during the night until the mum would leave the nest, would crawl into the nest to get the chick, and would then, using typical COVID-19 swaps that you are all used to by now, swap the oral cavities of these chicks to look for the presence of fungi. We could then use this portable genomic technology to directly, within very few hours, get results on this island of which fungus had infected these chicks and actually treat them with the right antifungal and sometimes antibiotic treatment. And this is really critical in an endangered species like the kakapo, where we have only around 200 individuals left in the entire world, so every chick counts. But we can like, use this real-time genomic technology also in the context of human health, and we will hear a bit more about that later in the session. For example, we are leveraging this to predict from our genomic data antibiotic resistances. For example, from bloodstream um, infections in patients directly in the clinic. And again here, it's super important that we have access to this technology all around the world. So we are using this in countries like Zimbabwe, where there is just no other technology to predict antibiotic resistances of pathogens. And like this, we can try to make antibiotic treatment more efficient. And at the intersection of human and animal health, we can actually work on zoonotic risk. So as an example, we are in Spain monitoring the transmission of avian influenza virus in the environment. So we are using these very cheap, just based on plastic bottles based, air sampling devices to sample air at sites where there is a lot of density of birds. And we can then detect avian influenza virus from these very simple sampling devices. And now with our genomic technology, we can actually sequence the genomic material of the virus, like this understand transmission patterns and evolution of the virus, and for example, how often it's spreading between wild bird populations and domestic bird populations. And I believe that avian influenza virus is also a big problem in wild bird species in Chile right now. We're obviously having such an in-situ approach anywhere in the country, in this really large country, could be very helpful. Now, finally, when we come to environmental monitoring, we can monitor entire ecosystems. Let's take the example of water. During my PhD in Cambridge in the UK, I've actually established this nanopore sequencing technology for freshwater monitoring, where we were looking at the local river and its pollution to, through pathogens. However, Freshwater quality is a lot more important than that, right? Like globally, access to fresh water is actually defined as one of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So what we did in our study is we took water samples upstream of the city and downstream where we have more natural habitats as well as in the city. And what we found is that, for example, at the really most polluted site 
that's location seven here, where we have a lot of human usage of the environment and a lot of agricultural intake. We found an increase in like human pathogens that really shows that how our human impact can have potential repercussions for human health. We also, for example, sampled the water from the river just downstream of a sewage pipe outlet, where actually the treated water from wastewater treatment plants was led into the river. And we found the typical signatures of bacteria that are actually being used in the wastewater treatment plant to treat the water. So that made a lot of sense. At the same time, though, we found an enrichment of Leptospira bacteria that are actually zoonotic bacteria that can cause the life-threatening disease, Wilde's disease. Now, there we really hypothesized that this is a perfect One Health example, where we are actually changing the environment in a way like, that we never intended. And like, this can lead, however, to, like, again, consequences for our own health, threatening our own health. Now, as another example, we can also monitor air quality. So, uh, we took here the example of the city Barcelona in Spain, which has like really highly polluted air, but as I understand, this is also a problem in Santiago, so I would love to repeat this study here in the city in the future. So here we have shown that we can robustly describe the air microbiome from this genomic data, so all like the organisms that live in the air. What you can see here, are like each of these bars are different sampling days. And you can see the composition of the most dominant microbial taxa here. And this is really just a protocol that we just established and published. We can see that even across days, the microbiome is relatively stable, which might come as a surprise for many, given the really fluctuating air environment. Here in this case, we actually looked at highly polluted air right next to a motorway in Barcelona. But then just to show you an example, when we went two kilometers further, just two kilometers, but into a more natural habitat, we actually find a completely different air microbiome. Again, showing how, without even seeing it through our actions, we are like, changing the environment in ways that we don't understand. And this brings me actually to the health of the Atacama Desert, because I've really been lucky enough for the last few days I spent my time in the Atacama Desert for field work in collaboration with a fantastic team of the company Oxford Nanopore Technologies and led by your local researcher here, Matthias Gutierrez, who is really like an advocate of this genomic technology here in Chile. So we were really interested in measuring the hidden biodiversity of the Atacama Desert because so little is known about these very remote ecosystems, because just very few studies exist about the actual genomics and the microbial biodiversity. But we are really interested in grasping this because we obviously know that we are having an impact on these ecosystems, just by visiting them, but also obviously through other human cost activities such as mining. So we took our entire portable setup into the desert. We had a lot of fun. We took a lot of samples, water samples, sediment samples, soil samples, and directly in the field extracted the DNA, sequenced the data, and analyzed the data. And I'm also very happy to say that we just made new use of the latest technology release, which is the so-called Mark 1D sequencer of Oxford Nanopore Technologies which is also a portable sequencing device that can just use the M1, M2 chips of your iPad to do the analysis, like all the AI analysis I've been mentioning, directly in the field, so really making this approach even more accessible. So I can give you some very brief insights, but we are obviously going to keep you in the loop about the final results of this study. We found a huge diversity of different cyanobacteria in these samples. Now, cyanobacteria are super interesting because they are actually living from photosynthesis, like plants, meaning they are using CO2 and producing oxygen, which sounds like a good thing for us, right? So, at this diversity, 
is probably a diversity that has never been described before. Because when we compared it to databases of genomic information, that the only sort of organisms we found that looked similar have previously been described in China and Japan. And this just means that probably these organisms have never been sequenced before, but with our genomic technology, we can actually create their genomic data, what we call de novo, yeah, completely newly, and can define a new species with that. We also saw that at sites that had in the past been like, used by humans, we found a lot less biodiversity, and actually mostly like Escherichia bacteria that you would associate with like human contact. So in this Atacama Desert uh, example brings me back to the idea of una salud or one health. Because I think it's a beautiful example of one health, and that we know there is a lot of hidden biodiversity, and this, might, this biodiversity might have a lot of ecosystem functions that might be important for us, especially in the future. But at the same time, we are obviously having an impact on this ecosystem. For example, as I mentioned before, through mining, right? Through mining the lithium there, we're having an impact. At the same time, as has been said already today, we are needing this lithium to create this, like, powerful batteries to store renewable energies, to create our Tesla cars, or even when you think about the human health concepts, smoke e-cigarettes instead of normal cigarettes. But I think the One Health concept, if we keep that in the back of our minds as a basis of our policy, it tells us that we always have to think holistically about our entire planet and always think about all the consequences, potentially unintended consequences, uh, this could have. And ideally, look at, like really equitably and in an inclusive manner in how we can improve the health of all on our planet. Muchas gracias.